started laughing. I was like, I'm going to hide. Like, you know, oh, and he didn't know. Yeah. yeah Brian did that. Yeah. That, Brian's a clever guy. All right. I have some good news and I have more good news. You want the more good news or the good or bitter news? It is cold in here because. I'll be able to make it colder in here. I'm glad you too. It, this is on camera now. This is broadcast worldwide. All right. You want the good news? We have a quiz tomorrow. You want more good news? You guys have an assembly third period. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. I am still in awe of that assembly. The amazing test that I think I want to apologize in advance for that assembly tomorrow. Why would I? Well, then they do a lottery. They do, they draw lots, and the students. I, I don't want to tell you. It's going to be pretty rough. Actually, that could be kind of fun. But no, they won't even do that. No, hearings drive me crazy. They don't listen to the people testifying, and it just drives me crazy. But I read the I read the article about it. I, I can understand what their argument is, why they want it, but it, it would be a, it would be a financial disaster for them. But I understand completely why they want it. Oh yeah, no, definitely. But they don't have any industry expertise. Their property taxes will, of course, we don't have. All right, here we go. Let's go take your notes out then. No, the good news is you have an assembly and a test. I will. We will have some more document stuff to do. Oh, I started going through the hip stuff, but I'm not quite done. And this is being recorded now. <laughs> All righty then. So let's go ahead then, and we are right on the Sherman and Boy, it's light here. What did that say? Oh, just make sure you're ready for that. I mean, I know you might have done that, but I'm just reminding you it's for you. <laughs> okay. And so, with with the, we got to the Sherman Antitrust, right? No. What did the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act do? It bought all that silver, then did what with the silver? Yeah, put it in basements all over the country. The Sherman, oh, uh, uh, the Interstate Commerce, Interstate Commerce Committee, could regulate railroad rates, but what was his problem? Had two problems. One, what? Yeah, didn't have any power. And what was the other problem? Who was appointed to the commission? Very quickly. Railroad. Yeah, railroad. What? I gave a name to this. What's this called? Regulatory capture. Regulatory capture. All right. So let's get to this really quick. So last thing, farmers. Three big bills in 1890. SSPA, and then SATA. Sherman Antitrust Act, right? And did we say what the law did? No. Could the Sherman Antitrust Act, and trust was synonymous with monopoly, said no, well, in the most basic element, no illegal restraint of trade. I'm writing right over Elvis and Nixon. No illegal restraint of trade. And Restraint trade are any of those things that pulls or monopolies do to undercut competitors, to set prices, to give bad service because they have a monopoly, all those things that railroads do too. That is what restraint of trade is. So in the most basic element is no monopolies or things that act like monopolies. Technically, but the law is written in such a way that nobody can understand what it says. It is just impossible. To understand. Is that on purpose? Of course it's on purpose. If it's written really vaguely, it can find loopholes. All you need to do is blow up, to blow up your head is look at tax law. It'll 
blow your skull apart. <laughs> okay, maybe don't do that. Don't do that. So, it never defined what a monopoly was. It never clearly defined what restraint of trade was. It never really defined that. And it's many pages. And then the Supreme Court is going to have to make a ruling. And a conservative Supreme Court ruled that holding companies were constitutional. Well, holding companies are what was created to create the monopolies. That's what John D. Rockefeller created with the Standard Oil of New Jersey. This big holding company is dominating over 90% of the oil industry. The law was worthless. Now, sad is still the law of the land. And we still, today, have to deal with all the things that are wrong with SATA. Hey, corporate or the big, those who have monopolies, love it. Hard to enforce. The only time the Sherman Antitrust Act was used in its first almost 15 years was to break up labor unions. Because it said that strikes, it said that strikes were under restraint of trade. That's not at all what people thought it was going to be. It broke up labor unions. When, when Woodrow Wilson was president, Woodrow Wilson in 1916, they would amend it with the Clayton Antitrust Act. We'll make the Sherman Antitrust Act a little bit stronger. But to this day, it is pretty weak. And yeah, there are definitely monopolies, or at least oligopolies. Remember that one where just a few companies? So. Not a very effective law. Disappointing, like the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act. The last law of 1893 that was very crucial was called the McKinley Tariff. It was just the Tariff Bill of 1890, but Senator, an up and coming Senator, William McKinley, got his name on it. He got it sponsored, kind of like Sherman did. Sponsored, now he's known. McKinley would become governor of Ohio, and he was a rising star because he was a solely owned entity of the Republican machine in Ohio. He was not considered the smartest man, which made him perfect. He could be controlled by the boss in Ohio, in reality, controlling the Republican Party. The McKinley tariff started out as a cotton tariff. A cotton tariff allowed for competition, prices would low. Low, that's what farmers won. But who was president in 1890? Cleveland's no longer president. He's president. Harrison. Yeah, Benjamin Harris. McKinley tariff in committee cut of the tariff. Went to the floor of the Senate. They debated this cut in the tariff. They debated it, debated it. They voted on it. It passed. Everybody, the assumption was when it passed, it's going to cut the tariff. Maybe someone should have read the bill. It increased tariffs. Now, some of you might say, oh, how could they do that? How could congressmen not read the bill? What's the truth? They never read the bills. To this day. You think they read those things? No. They're told what's in it, and sometimes, or sometimes they're not told, and they vote. Isn't that comforting? Don't you feel good about that? I'm not kidding. They don't read the bills. They might read the little summary, but they don't read the whole thing. They're raising money. And so the tariff was another disappointment. And after these three things and the realization that the ICC was going to be nothing more than a rubber stamp, that is when a bunch of disparate groups got together and decided, being led by farmers in the plains in the West, and said, we need our own political party. Both parties are corrupt and dominated by special interests. Either the Democrats are dominated by the machine or plantation owners in the South, the Republicans are dominated by corporate interests. Our party, it'll be called the People's Party. But everybody called them the populists. The technical name is the People's Party. It was created in a conference in Cincinnati, but don't worry about Cincinnati so much. They're a brand new party in 1891. 
And then before you write down who's in the party, I love this cartoon. It's from Punch Magazine. And it has all the different groups that kind of came together. The old Greenback Party that wanted, wanted currency for inflation. The old Granger Party, the Knights of Labor. Free Silver Party, Prohibition Party, Farmers Alliance. Um, the old socialist. Who's this? Anarchist. Anarchist. Yeah, and then we got the communists right there. I mean, it's a really diverse group. That's why you know the people. But the main group, farmers in the south and the plains, Montana was a big populous state for 15 years. Major. And miners. They never appealed to other groups. They were intensely anti-urban, anti-immigration. They didn't like the immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, and a lot of the Jewish immigrants. And they were anti-intellectual. Well, it's not smart. Intellectual does not mean you're smart. But when they were anti-intellectual, they didn't like these very highly educated people, because they believed it's these people that are using that to cheat them. It is these people that are passing the laws like the Sherman Antitrust Act. These intellectuals that get their degrees to fool people. So, intellectual does not mean you're intelligent. Actually, it doesn't. It just means more like either, to their point of view, they're using their intelligence to get us. But then again, it would give this reputation of being dumb farmers. They like to call intellectuals pointy heads. Which I always think is a funny name. Why are you with pointy head? It gets all the knowledge just focused on top. You're a pointy head and not a worker. But anti Semitic was a real problem, too. What does anti Semitic mean? Most people think it's anti Jewish. It is anti Jew, but it's also anti Arab. But the one they cared about are anti Jew. The Semitic people are the live in the Arabic Peninsula. Jews was more than just the fact that there was a wave of Jewish immigrants that were coming in the 1890s, escaping uh, anti-Jewish anti -Jewish, uh, policies in Russia. This goes back to medieval Europe. Farmers are in debt. Nobody likes the people they're in debt to, meaning bankers. Medieval Europe, what was the myth that simply was not really true about Jews? They're what? They were the cause of everything. Well, not the cause of everything, but specifically in this context, they're the bankers and they have the money. And so they're manipulating everything. And there were some powerful Jewish banking families, but it's just simply not true. But this kind of prejudice became very, very potent. There was one big banking family, but people believed it. Yeah. The, the, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Yeah, we talked about that in AP year old. And, you know, there's a lot of very racist statements about Jews that come from about being uh, these miserly people who had all the money. Most of the Jews who came to the United States were, heck, they were dirt poor farmers in Russia, and they were dirt poor in the United States. And so, that is the populist party. And they're going to have a convention. And they're going to be active in the election of 1892. And this is big, because in 1892, they're going to meet in the most cosmopolitan town in the United States. I would argue the crossroads of Western civilization. No, not Cincinnati, even more dynamic. When you think about it, I mean, right now, I'm naming this city, all of you have a place in mind. And I can guarantee I would bet everybody, I bet everyone has the same place. Close. Very close. Where do you want to go if you want culture, the arts, the sciences, just a variety of people, and ideas, and thoughts? Where do you go? It's obvious. Omaha, Nebraska. Right? I know. I just said Omaha. People are like, going, Omaha, my dream. Most of you have never had, just can't go to Omaha. Frankly, I understand you're not worthy, you're scared. <laughs> Who's been to Omaha? Me and you are the only two. We are so 
cool. I knew there was something sophisticated about you. Oh, one more thing I forgot. When they met in Oman at an Oman convention, I love this cartoon because this is a kind of this populist idea that's happening. The big corporations were taking over everything. And there are all these cartoons of different corporate entities, different trusts, they call them, as octopus. So this is standard oil. And here it is controlling all parts of the end of the country, including the railroads, controlling people, and is that yeah, the capital, Washington, DC. And this is a lot of cartoons. We need to get rid of that control by big corporate interests that control everything and get it back to the people. So they went met in Oprah. For Omaha, their convention of the People's Party, they really try to play that we're going to be for the betterment of people. These are the basic elements, their platform. And the first big one is they wanted inflation. They wanted either paper currency or more and more simply free silver. Now, free silver did not mean walking up and down the streets handing people mounds of silver. They would go door to door and do it. No, it's not the plan. Free silver meant the government would pay for the minting of silver. Government would buy the silver from the miners, they would mint it and then distribute it, creating inflation. Before, the miners had to pay to mint it. So that's free silver. Free silver. Inflation will get prices up and allow for people to get out of debt. If you're in debt, you want inflation. Bad one. Next, they were very anti-bank. They wanted to control the banks, get rid of any kind of national bank or the national treasury, and they wanted government-controlled banks. And one of their most creative ideas was for postal banks through the post office. The charter that created the post office allows for the banks, or allows for post offices, in essence, to become a, a commercial bank. So the loan money for people. It's still there today. The president could actually turn or allow the post office to become a bank. It's actually a really pretty interesting idea because a lot of people have a difficulty getting to banks, post offices are there, it can do low interest, it can be very safe. They wanted it through the post office. North Dakota was very populous back then. And North Dakota would actually do it on the state level. There are state banks in North Dakota. They charge lower interest rates, they're very safe. In the 2008 financial panic, when the banking system literally froze in October of 2008, didn't happen in North Dakota because their banking system was protected by their state government. So it's a it's an interesting idea. Government control. Some businesses are far too important to be left out to profit, to left out to be gouging. There needs to be government control, maybe even government ownership. And three of the key industries they talked about were railroads, which makes sense thinking farmers are getting gouged, but then they're pretty clairvoyant. They saw the importance of information, telegraph and telephone. Telephones are brand new, but the idea was they looked at it, only a few will be able to afford telephones, we need to get it to everybody, which is kind of what would happen in the 1930s. The government would help fund cooperative telephone companies to get it to rural areas. They did the same thing for electricity. Direct election of senators. We've already talked about senators chosen by state assemblies. They also wanted a progressive income tax. A conservative Supreme Court made a very curious ruling 15 years before this that banned income taxes. It really is curious because Congress has the power to tax. So they either want to overturn that decision or have an amendment. There would be an amendment in 1913. But there was no income tax, and there are a lot of reasons why they wanted it. But the big thing was most of the taxes get poor people. An income tax, they could get more fairly. Progressive means what happened to the rate? What happens to rates compared to wealth? Percentage of tax pay. Yeah. The richer you are, the higher percentage of tax. Most taxes are the opposite. The poorer you are, the higher percentage of tax. Most taxes are regressive. Sales taxes are the worst. They're very, very, very regressive. So, 
of progressive income tax. Now, partially, they wanted to tax where the wealth was. They wanted to tax the profits, which focus on the top because of capitalism. It wasn't being taxed. And so that allowed for this creation of massive fortunes and massive, uh, massive uh, power in the hands of a few. But this is what we have to get down for the progressive income tax. The progressive income tax has another effect for working people. It raises wages. The higher the progressive tax for the very top, has a direct effect, this is what we got to get down, a direct effect, it raises wages for the vast majority of other people. Has everyone got that? It raises wages. Now, you might be counterintuitive. How does raising taxes raise wages? Well, if the highest rates are focused on the top, the people who own business or profit from them, if they get paid huge amounts of money or huge dividends, so they get a bunch of profit as income, it's taxed a lot. So there's an incentive to not pay them as much. If they don't pay them as much, where does that money remain? Where? Well, it eventually will go down to the bottom. But it remains in the company. That's reinvestment in the company. Reinvestment of the company has the effect in the long run of raising wages for everybody else. If the money stays in the company, in the long run, they will produce more, very things will happen, but wages go up for almost everybody else. If taxes are low on top, they'll pay themselves and keep the money. Just keep it. If taxes are high, it's taxed. It's a disincentive to keep it. The highest wages in American history were from World War II to the end of the 1980s. The highest marginal income tax at that rate was 91%. And people were taking home more pay than ever before. And had more wealth than an average people. One of the big things that the wealthy wanted to do is lower the tax rate for them on top. They got lowered in 81, 86. It's now about 37%. Where did you drop? So it's like... What's like your income What's mine? Well, it's marginal, so we're not going to get to the whole income tax, but they're marginal income tax rates. So I pay, my rates are 10, 15, and 28. So most people, most people are 10 and 15. So I mean, you're really not that well. And I'm by no means really rich. I know you find that hard to believe. You know, you, you high school teachers and all the wealth you flaunt, you know directly. Next, they also, for the same reason, want an inheritance tax. Same issue. If you pass off, they want inheritance on really big inheritances. Not for 95% for of the population, just for the really big. Same deal. If you pass on huge inheritance to the two children, the huge ones, there's no, it doesn't have any effect of raising anybody's wages. It's, it just becomes an inherited aristocracy. And the country, the United States was built was built on this idea of you get as far as your abilities take you, not your parents. Is Montana is a million dollars, like that's a million dollars before it gets taxed. Montana has no inheritance. No inheritance at all. The United States right now is what? First five million? The first five million is untaxed. So about 99.3% of inheritances are taxable. Right. And the first five million is not taxed at all. So if, if you get inherited, if your inheritance is 10 million, which I know is a problem for all of you, what do I do with this 10 million inheritance I'm going to get? The first five million you get no taxage. How bad is it tax rate? It's not getting taxed. It goes up to 35. And then, oh, don't write social morality yet. I got it out of order. Write down the secret ballot. They wanted secret ballots for lunch. They wanted people to vote in private so they not, won't be intimidated by either bosses or whatever. So back then you vote in public. And you can imagine the powers that be love voting in public. Because they just stand there and watch it. Who are you voting for, mister? Me and some friends here are going to ask you again. And my guess is you'll vote for uh, you vote for the people's party? My friends not in So then I'll see what 
There you go. You would too, would you wouldn't stand up. Yeah. Which knee was your bad knee? <laughs> I'm just asking. I don't know. I don't know. Well they'll figure it out with a hammer. <laughs> Bang! You didn't scream enough, it must be this way. Bang! Alright. Oh man, it's the first leg we know. Social morality is lies. And they have an overriding philosophy. Social morality. Social morality. And it's this concept that you can't do whatever you want with your property, your wealth. Community has to have or must be considered. So you can't do whatever, how you pay workers, how you treat your workers, or for that matter, pollution or any number of things. There's a responsibility to, to the rest of the community. And even though most business leaders do not believe in this, for much of my life, that was the norm. Your know, businesses kind of believe, well, you know, we got to kind of pay our workers better. Until the 1980s, and that went away. That's not today. You're in a different world than I grew up in. Hmm? And what the reason is, is you have to, it's, you can't do whatever you want your property because they're intensely anti social Darwinism. Intensely. They hate social Darwinism. Social morality is the antithesis of social Darwinism. Social Darwinism, I do whatever I want to get rich, it's natural and accumulate wealth. The populace despise social morality. This concept that you can't do whatever you want. And a lot of people, to the populace, they would make the argument, a lot of people work very hard and are very important to society and aren't rich. Are they lazy? Or people are unemployed in a bad economic times. They're unemployed not because they're lazy, but because of problems in Capitalism. Now, they are not anti-capitalist. They want to reform capitalism. I didn't write that down, but write that down somewhere next to it. They want to reform capitalism. But their opponents are going to call this what? Yeah, they got the whole thing. They're a bunch of bomb-throwing anarchists. Some populists even want an equal rights with the races, but most of the populace were intensely racist. That is the People's Party. Uh, James Weaver was, I mean, Weaver was their nominee. This is the people, and this is the populist campaign where labor workers get together, they can balance out the rich. This is very anti-Semitic cartoon too. And labor versus greed, a warning to Plutocracy. And as they saw it, were, the United States in 1890, 1890 was a plutocracy. What does plutocracy mean? We've heard of democracy, we've heard of a republic. What's a plutocracy? That's a plutocrat. A plutocracy is a form of government. Not ne not necessarily business, but you're on the right track. Rule by the rich. A plutocracy is rule by the rich. And so what they're saying is, we're not a democracy, we're a plutocracy. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So, oh, one more thing. Uh, what's a kleptocracy then? Yeah, a government that's basic function is to steal from the people. Russia. Putin is a klep. <laughs> I'm going to have some former KGB agents visit me. The government in, uh, that's in Afghanistan that we left is a kleptocracy by definition. So. In the election of 1892, then, it's going to be a very, very unusual election. A third party. Now, you can see it on there. Uncle Grover came back again. Uncle Grover as the Democrat. Harrison's the Republican. But Weaver, a candidate for the People's Party, and look how well Weaver did. I mean, literally, the party was created at the end of 1891. 
They got 22 electoral votes, and they did really, really well on state elections. They did really well in Montana. But Cleveland was elected president. Cleveland was elected. And both parties saw Weaver and the People's Party as a threat. But to the Democrats, they were a bigger threat. What are the experts? The what? Oh, that's just footnotes to oh. say how the votes were split. Some electors in North Dakota, the electors voted, one elector vote, or they split three ways, the three electors. Like they don't, yeah, they only had nine back then. That's kind of weird, isn't it? California have nine. How many do they have now? How many is Montana have now? You used to have four, and now they have three. That three is the minimum. Right? Why, wait, wait, wait. Why is three the minimum electoral votes? The number of electors is decided by the number of what? Members of Congress. Montana, every state has two members of the Senate, and we have one member of the House. Why did we, did we have four? Because of you. Montana did grow in population, but they got lost in 19. Not really that Montana lost population, it's that everyone else came. So, Cleveland became president, and almost immediately there's a hack. And this one was worse than 1873. And this is actually from a, an advertisement for a book called The War of Wealth. And remember we talked about boom and bust, overproduction, overspeculation. And the big things, overproduction and speculation in railroads, and gold. There were attempts to corner the gold market as other countries went on the formal gold standard like the United States did and Britain had. There was a, the, the amount of gold went up in value. People tried to corner the market, the government to pay more. There were all these kind of fake stocks in gold, insurance on wealth. All these crazy things happen. But you have to add one more thing. Cleveland, as president, vowed to change the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act because it was just putting money in or putting silver in basements. People thought he might coin money. No. What Cleveland did is he signed a bill to revoke the SSPA. Almost immediately, all that money that was going out into the economy to buy silver stopped. That created a shock that led to the panic. Now, the country was already in an economic recession. Panic was probably unavoidable. But once that happened, horrific panic. Within six months, the country was in a crushing depression. Absolutely crushing depression. Thousands of workers were unemployed. Thousands of workers were unemployed. And I want to get these numbers down here. Within six months, eight, I just listened to these numbers. Within six months, 8,000 businesses closed their doors. A third of all the banks in the United States shut their doors. The unemployment rate, they're guessing on the percentage of unemployment rate, but in urban areas, the assumption was it was between 25 and 30% were unemployed. In some areas, as high as 50%. This was an economic catastrophe. Worse than 1873, worldwide, and has a lot of parallels to your panic. The panic that you gotta live through in 2008. A lot of really close comparisons. Not only were the causes similar, but the long-term unemployment was very similar. A lot of the same things. You've lived through one minor panic in 2000, one full-scale, good old-fashioned panic, that's what you've had, too. You know how many panics I've had in my lifetime? Twelve. Two. Same ones as you. I was concerned about me. During the New Deal, the regulations put on banks and investment made sure there was no panics. They kept the financial system stable. They got rid of those regulations. Now we're riding the wave. I'm with you. But I'm old. You can enjoy it for your whole life as young people. 
You're supposed to smile. You're riding the wave. <laughs> it's, yeah, let's do a wave. It's, uh, it, it, it blows my mind that they've allowed this to happen. Back to this. This was horrific. But then two things happened in 1894 that made it seem not just like a horrific panic, but that the country might literally fall apart. And remember, this is worldwide. So there was rioting and protests and assassinations all over Europe, too. But two big events. Number one, oh, this, I love this cartoon. Here is the idea of panic, depression. And these are all what people thought they had, paper certificates that they thought were worth money, and they're being shoveled into, into the gutter by panic. That's worth nothing. That would be an awesome Halloween mask. Who agrees? Yeah, right? The Pullman strike. Let's have a dress like Panic Day. Somebody would call you a terrorist and be jailed. Didn't you have that after the Zoom? Hmm? Didn't you have that after the Zoom? Yeah, two years, three years ago, two years ago, someone dressed up as Dress Like Day. They dressed up as Lawrence of Arabia. And somebody said that they were a terrorist. Dressing up as a terrorist. Yeah, stereotypes are fun. You don't need to think. You don't need to know anything. And I like stereotypes. And uh, yeah. And then another girl dressed up as Darth Vader. Because we did characters of the 20th century. And her sister's in my fifth grade class. She dressed up as Darth Vader. And so she got stopped in the hallway and said, you're dressed up as a terrorist. I heard about this. Now, to be honest, Darth Vader kind of is a terrorist, but! <laughs> yeah, it was Mary Nichols' sister. I was really, I heard about that, I was, I was not only laughing, but also kind of, I was sad. The Pullman Strike. Okay, the Pullman Strike. I saved the Pullman Strike to here because this is an 1894 strike, and it's at the Pullman Railway Carriage Company. So this is a Pullman dining car. The Pullman company made first class cars, railway cars, carriages they call them, for trains. So they had the fine dining chairs and the uh, cars and the, um, the luxury first class seating for trains. They were still making money. Their profits did go down in the panic, but they were still making money. But if they're making money, but there's 25% unemployment, what did the Pullman company do to their workers? Lower Say it again? Lower wages. They lowered their wages and raised prices in the company town. Why? Because they could. By the way, would that be the populist definition of social morality? No. Would that be what the populist would think be social morality, or would the populist think that's probably not very well? Which one? To the populace, it's a group. See, if you don't have us, I'll see what they do. Well, the workers went on strike. Their union went on strike. And these are strikers outside the company. I love the old, this old, the Pullman Company, the older style of building. They went on strike. Well, this is when it became, it turned into a nationwide strike. When Eugene Debs, remember we mentioned him before, and the American Railway Union. He was the head of the American Railway Union, the biggest union of railway workers. Debs joined the strike. It's actually called, uh, they didn't cross, they would refuse to cross the picket line. Debs and his union said, we will not work on any railway cars that use a Pullman, or any trains that use a Pullman car. What Debs was thinking was very logical. If Pullman can do that to their workers and get away from it, what's going to happen to the his workers, or the members of his union, and the, um, what's going to happen to them? Yeah, they'll get their wages cut. So the strike turned nationwide. Well, the governor of Illinois, where the center of the strike was, refused to send the troops out. The company was shocked. You're supposed to shoot these guys. It turned into a huge success for Debs. His statue went up greatly, and then this happened. Rail 
railroad started putting mail onto every train that had a Pullman car. The American Railway Union said they wouldn't work on it, but it had a mail car. Does anybody know why that's a big deal? In the United States Constitution, it says Congress will deliver the mail. Got that? Congress will deliver the mail. Congress has that responsibility. The Congress created a post office. That is a federal responsibility. They're violating the Constitution. So they took it to the court, and the judge gave an injunction. An injunction is a court order that says, you got to get back to work and deliver the mail. Debs refused because he knew it was a scam. That gave an excuse for President Cleveland to do what? Do what? Send out the troops. He sent the troops in to force the workers to go back to work and break the strike and pay in that point. That's depth right here. There are soldiers dispersing it. Over 100 people would be killed or wounded as soldiers came out. And even though this shows white soldiers, remember they used a lot of black soldiers. We talked about this before. Debs was horrified by this. Debs was in prison for violating a court order, by definition, a political prisoner. And Debs, while in prison, would change into a socialist. And that is where we get Debs as the leader of the modern socialists. Here he is running for president in 1900. There's Debs giving a speech in 1916. And this is the campaign button for Debs in 1920. You see him? How old was he? He was in prison for opposing World War I. He got over a million votes from a prison cell in 1920. I love this for President Convict number 9653. I have one of these buttons. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. No, it's not. I should have. I might bring it in 1920. When we get to 1920, I might bring it if we go back in time. <laughs> So I'm not bringing it in. No, I just have to remember. Yeah. Um. So why didn't the Illinois governor send troops? His name was Altgeld, Governor Uckel, and he was a, a, not only a, a Democrat, and so he was a little bit more sympathetic to the Union, but he was really worried about that growth of the populace, and he was worried if he sent out the troops, this might give not only the populace more ammunition, but also one more thing it might turn into like the great out people. And I was Mm -hmm. So if um, it's unconstitutional to send mail, then how did they? It's unconstitutional to to, to, no, stop, to stop yeah, the delivery mail. Stop it. Then how did they do the um, gag mail things? Yeah. that's unconstitutional. The gag rule was unconstitutional, and when they banned the delivery of abolitionist material, yeah, that was unconstitutional. But it needs a court case. And then one more thing happened in 1894. It's called Coxey's Army. Jacob Coxey, Jacob Coxey was from Ohio. And Coxey, he's a populist. He came up with an idea. If we have all these unemployed, and the problem is no one's buying stuff, let's create demand. How do you create demand? His idea, have the government create jobs. There's all kinds of things that needed to be done. All kinds of things that they thought they could do, but specialists. Cities need to be rebuilt. They were yeah, all sorts of things. Let's have the government give them jobs. Then they'll have money. That creates demand, get the economy going. Coxie had this idea and it spread like wire for wildfire throughout the country. And soon thousands of people joined Coxie and they, he made it into, I called it his army. And they, this is the key thing, they begin to march on Washington, D.C. And so these are members of Coxie's army that give you an idea how desperate they were. They abandoned everything to go to Washington, D.C. to ask Congress to give them a job. These are marchers in a little city in Ohio. This is Coxie's army as it neared Washington, D.C. And that was their plan. They would go from town to town, get enough money to move on to the next town, go to Washington, D.C. And there were a lot of members of the House of Representatives, especially, that wanted this, but Cleveland wanted nothing to do with this. 
Cleveland, what's the result of all the missing? Get a job. You must be lazy. A lot of people came to Montana. A lot. Not only farmers, but all those miners that got unemployed when they repealed the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act. A lot of miners from around the northwestern part of the state all began to come to Missoula to join Coxie's army. And they just showed up. And they went around and said, we want, can you help us get to Washington, D.C.? Well, Missoula, that was a town of about 16,000 men, said no. No, get out of our town. We didn't want a bunch of unemployed workers in town. They already had their own unemployed. And so the people said, okay, we're not leaving. So guess what they did? They said, huh? They said, no, they sent them to Butte. That's the word. Do you get it? They went to Butte. They got to Butte. We're not leaving. They got into Bozeman. Then the Billings and the Miles and so on. And that's how they made the Washington, D.C. They would get there, give us money or we're staying. I think that's pretty clever. When they got there, they camped right outside the Capitol. They camped right there. They said, we're not going to leave until action happens. Now, you think about it for a second. You have all these people marching on Washington, D.C., especially considering the violence that just happened with the Pullman strike. They march on Washington, D.C., and they call themselves an army. What does this look like? This is like revolution. Everybody's big fear. Now, as it turned out, they were most certainly not revolutionaries. These are desperate, hungry people who want to work. And how they got rid of them was ingenious and, I would argue, cruel. They camped on the front lawn or the lawn near the White House and the Capitol. So Congress passed a law saying you can't walk on the grass. The next morning, arrested them all. Yeah, just Congress was put in jail. It kind of broke up, and these poor people wandered from town to town. So Cox's army didn't materialize in anything huge, but the point is, it looked like revolution. And that is when we're leading to this. The, don't write down the poppies. I put this out, these are a couple of this cartoons, but here's the key issue. Everybody, they have all these problems. The Republicans and Democrats wanted to keep doing the same thing and let it go on. The populace had an answer. Bimetallism was another term for silver coinage, silver and gold. So these are like the populace helping America up. The populace have a solution. Everybody thought, for good reason, 1896 might be the year of the populace. So let me get to this really quick. So the election of 1896. 1896 was one of the most important elections in American history. Every 36 years is one of these elections that show how the country was dramatically changing. 1860s, Lincoln, 1896. This election we're doing right now, 1930, 1932 is FDR. 1968 is Nixon. I don't like Nixon. That's the only one I'll tell you I do not like, and I have a very good reason why. We'll get to it. So, what this cartoon is, the populists thought they would win most of the country. They figured the other parties would be here. And so what it says is, the silver dog with the golden tail. Do they want the coinage of silver? Will the tail wag the dog or the dog wag the tail? Or will this section here that will vote for the Republicans and the gold standard win? That's the creepy dog. And last thing for today, last thing, the election came down, all these big issues came down to something very simple. Gold meant conservative, silver meant liberal wasn't quite used yet, but more liberal. Quick list, well, there'll be no more than 30 questions, I promise you. In fact, I can guarantee you it will not be over 100 questions. You can take that to the bank. Do I have everybody's tip? I have everybody's tip. That's a weird thing to say. I'll study all that. Why? Sign up for what? Well, you're not studying all the other groups. Probably. Uh, second group.
Okay. I'm glaring at you. And then you kick my garbage can. This is the second day I've caught you lurking in my hallway. I've caught you lurking in this hallway also. Uh, I got a license. <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> Would you quiz? Not really, but I mean, <laughs> half sheet of paper. Half my grade. It's only fair. Can you argue against that? Not really. <sighs> what are you looking for? Oh, 